This is Actualize Freedom. Straight talk on growing clicks and conversions on Amazon FBA from people doing it every day. Now here's your host, digital marketing acrobat, Danny Kenji Carlson. What's up, guys? Danny Carlson here with the Actualize Freedom Podcast. And today's guest is a very interesting case study. So he does, has a multiple eight-figure business um, in various areas of Amazon. So he's an Amazon seller with three brands, also has a pretty massive coaching community, which um, right before this call started, we got a little office tour, and it's pretty impressive the office he's got set up over there. Um, also in the Amazon seller software space. So I think this is going to be really interesting insight because not many people have the insights from that many different angles from the coaching from their own actual experience selling and from the software side and all the data that comes with that um and also the agency side so adam's pretty much got them all covered so if you guys want probably a really unique insight into the amazon world it's going to be from adam hudson how's it going adam where about you joining us from today man i'm uh, on the gold coast of australia today so it's it's a beautiful time of year here Awesome. Well, the weather never really gets bad over there, doesn't it? So don't rub it into anyone over <laughs> in a cold part of the world right now. So Adam, where I'd like to start in this interview is you have a really diverse background when it comes to starting businesses. You've been doing this for a long time. Um, you've been through a lot of ups and downs. So maybe take us through, like, what are some of the, the key pivotal ups and downs of your entrepreneurial journey? Like, what are the moments that like really defined you into the entrepreneur that you are today with this multiple eight figure business? Yeah, look, um, you know, I think uh, to give people context, I'm 45 years old now. And I started, um, you know, with my first Tony Robbins book when I was 17. And I finished up working at my last job when I was 22. So I've sort of been self employed full time as an entrepreneur since the age of 22. So 23 years of entre you know, proper entrepreneurship, full time self employed in my own businesses. <laughs> And I think like many people, it was just a desire for freedom, which is what I love about your podcast, Actualizing Freedom. How do you actually do that? Um, and I think that really lies at the heart. If you peel the apple or peel the onion, as they say on most uh, entrepreneurs, lying at the heart of it is they just want um, dominion over their own time, agency over their own life, you know? So really that was what guided me. And along the way, many ups and downs and more downs than ups. And you often find that... Um, it's the hardships and the really tough lessons that you read about in personal growth or business books um, are one thing, but when you actually live them, that's what actually changes you into a, a much better and more competent entrepreneur. Awesome. And so like, just so people have an idea, you mentioned you have more downs than ups. Like what would you say is the ratio of your, you know, your catastrophic failures of businesses that didn't work out to the ones that actually work out just so people, you know, maybe don't feel so bad if their their first or second business venture is just not really working for them. Yeah, look, it's a stigma. I think we as entrepreneurs need to overcome really quickly and especially people in Australia, like in Australia, it's almost illegal to fail. People give you so much grief if you fail at something in the U S it's kind of a lot more acceptable for, to have a go at something and to fail. But it, you know, failures doesn't, don't necessarily mean losing your life savings or anything. They can just be businesses that are just not going that well. They're just, they're not clicking. You're not making enough money. And I would probably say if you took my net worth and divided it up between all the different business ventures, it's like the 80, 20 rule, like 80, 80% 80 of the wealth came from 20% of the businesses. Um, and a lot of businesses I just started, I didn't think them through or my mind wasn't experienced enough to see the flaws in the businesses. So when I first started, I started with Amway when I was 17. Somebody showed me the Amway plan and I was like, I'm in. You know? And then as you get older, you go, I need to ask better questions and get smarter. So, you know, I always joke about it, same in dating. You know, when you're a young guy, you'll date any girl that smiles at you. But as you get older, um, you, you, know, you, you have a bit of more of a refined list and the same goes for ladies. So we get better at, at, at refining our um, our needs for our um, purposes as we get older. So, um, yeah. Yeah, you waded through the MLMs and, you know, pyramid shapes. Now, you can argue whether it's a pyramid scheme or not, but you, you went through a lot of different things before <laughs> you arrived at what you're doing now. Um, and you do have a really interesting take when it comes to creating products that are defensible on Amazon as opposed to just things that people can copycat. I know that's a big part of your strategy that you teach with your students. Um, and have some very successful case studies with that. So explain your process for creating products that are more defensible, that are actually unique um, and bring something unique to the marketplace. 
Yeah, so look, I've been selling on Amazon for eight years. And in that time, the marketplace has changed a lot, um, uh, especially for smaller sellers. Eight years ago, there were guys running around what I do, which is I also teach Amazon, saying, get this piece of software, um, you know, find out where, where these big categories are and just go to China, get, your, get the sticker changed over to your brand and you're in business, you're a private label seller. And that worked eight years ago, you know, just take it, get a different colored one or, or, you know, put your own brand on it. Just, it was just about taking some market share off somebody else. Um, but the market's maturing now and the, the world's changing. And, and I, I do a lot of public speaking and, and um, I was just on stage with Tony Robbins last week in Sydney. And um, I was talking about the, um, the world uh, today, you know, in India and China, they're turning out millions of people with degrees every year. Um, you know, so this learned rote knowledge, which if you apply it in the context of Amazon, just going and getting a piece of software and putting in some variables and going, boom, there's my answer. If you think you're going to be successful long-term on Amazon doing that, you're just not. Everybody else has got the same data as well. Where the value is now is in thinking and protecting that thinking as best you can. It is the soft skills like Steve Jobs didn't just slightly change a computer. He completely reimagined what a computer could be. That's an extreme example. So when you come into Amazon, the key, in my opinion, is first of all, um, you've got to find, like I, I teach a, a little Venn diagram, which is you've got to sell something that has high demand, that has a gas factor. Gas means give a shit. <laughs> so things that people care about. So if you sell Kleenex tissues and you want to be a competitor, nobody really gives a shit about tissues. They're going to go to Amazon, put in tissues, see Kleenex, five bucks, they're done. But if they're going in and they're going to buy a wedding dress, there's a high give a shit factor. So people are going to go through 10, 20, 50 pages, are going to read the reviews, going to look at the photos, and they're going to reward you financially with the purchase and perhaps a premium if they love the, the design that you've made. So approaching Amazon now, and the last bit is, is, is op, um, market opportunity. So where is there a gap? So if there's lots of them selling and people care about the product, where is there a gap in the marketplace? And I often use the example of wedding cake toppers. You just see like two white people that are skinny as wedding cake toppers. So what about our, our, our black friends? What about our gay friends? What about overweight people? What about Trump supporters? What about Hillary supporters? You know, like young people, people with tattoos, you know, like there's all these sections within those categories that are under service. So it's really having that imagination to create a product that does take more time and it does take more effort and does involve getting some designers involved and things like that. But then you create a product that's visually differentiated in the market, super, super key. You know, it has to stand out because, you know, when people search Amazon, it's like the Tinder of products. They put in what they're looking for. And the first thing we look at because we're shallow is the photo. If we don't like the photo or the, what's in the photo, we're done. So same with products. You've got to visually stand out in a way that uh, is serving a market that is underserviced. If you can win those two things, then, you, you, you know, you've really got, the starting point of a, of a, of a proper market and you can protect it if, you, if, if possible with a design patent or something. And they're not expensive. They're not hard to get um, so that you can patent the way it looks if it's unique and, and look after yourself a bit better. It's slower, but in, it, otherwise many, many categories now races to the bottom. Yeah, I just had a hilarious image pop into my head when you said wedding cake toppers for Donald Trump supporters. I just had like an image of like, you know, a bride and a groom with Donald Trump in between as as the priest, like like marrying there them or go. something. So, so anyone who <laughs> wants to go launch that product on Amazon, I expect a royalty for that one. Um, so send it to my email, please. Um, but so one thing I think a lot of people they they understand this and they agree that like obviously it's better to create a proprietary product that provides real value and is unique and everything like that um but like where do we weigh that with the extra time and budget that it takes to create these products right so like if someone wanted to start on amazon and they have a smaller budget does it make sense for them to do it like where you know where does it start to make sense budget wise and from like a, a time like you know one year timeline, two year timeline kind of thing? Yeah, great, great question. So the, the most important thing for anybody who's early on in the Amazon journey, set aside what I just said and, and make this number one, two words, go live, right? 98% of Amazon seller accounts that get opened according to Market Pulse in 2018, 98% of the accounts opened, which was over a million seller accounts in the US were open, sorry, globally, a million were open, 98% never listed a single product. So they got all excited on a webinar or they heard a friend talk about Amazon, but they never went live with one thing. If you can get 
live, even if you just sell one tennis ball, right? A tennis ball that's in your, you know, local Walmart. The act of taking the photo, opening the seller account, writing the headline, writing the bullet points, writing your keywords, you know, that then pieces together 80% of what it takes to be an Amazon seller. The rest is imagination and product sourcing after that. But you've done the scary bit. You've actually made your first dollar on Amazon. So that's the first thing. And there are still lots of opportunities on Amazon to, um, to find categories that are like people just dead asleep at the wheel. And like to give you an example of what I mean, like most people will go and they go, oh, I want to be an Amazon seller. So I'm going to think about what I love and I'm going to sell that. Well, that's a nice touchy feely thing, but it's business, right? You, you go where the money is, you go where the opportunity is, you don't go where your heart is necessarily first up, especially in a product driven business. If, if you, you love something and it's close to you and you go to Amazon, everybody sucks that's selling there, great. But that's not going to be the case for most people. So I say, all right, why don't you go and look at, um, you know, shower chairs on Amazon, right? So shower chairs are chairs that people who are uh, either disabled or injured or old need to put in the shower, right? Now, if you go to page one of Amazon, it's changing because I've been saying this now for a while publicly, but it used to be, it pretty much still is, just all plain white plastic chairs that are almost exactly the same. So the, med the whole medical area is pretty much like that. It's dominated by boring um, dinosaur medical companies, medical devices, simple medical devices like a toilet seat, right? There's not much innovation. There's not like hackers and young marketers and they're all in supplements and skincare because the margins and all the hype around it. They're not selling like urinary systems for men with incontinence problems, right? Which is a huge market, by the way. Like the average shower chair on Amazon is doing $50,000 a month but nobody's paying attention because they're not sexy. So I'm more interested in going into these less sexy categories where you're competing with dinosaur companies. There's 200 million products, but people just don't let their mind wander far enough. They want to make a cheese board or they want to make a, you know, a, a, a picnic rug because they're a middle-aged, white, wealthy Westerner uh, and they think that the whole world is like that instead of thinking about the entire market out there on all, all categories. And so you've explained a little bit of your criteria so far for really identifying these products. Uh, what would be your criteria for, um, like what's an indicator that a product is just a boring product that there's room for you to create a, a better version of it or maybe a proprietary, uh, proprietary product that can fit the same need? Like what are your indicators that you're looking for of these like stagnant products ripe for innovation? Well, it's interesting in our in our software in Zonguru, we've just launched a tool called Niche Raider. So you just push a button, like you've just done a search for shower chairs, push a button, and it re it looks at the top listings and ranks it based on how many um, competitors there are, uh, how um, how many of the photos of the of the uh, photo set are being used. Like often in the medical category, there's like two photos of the product. That's it, and they're making twenty to fifty grand a month because Daryl and Ecom has just bulk uploaded their entire catalog, right? Um, they haven't actually had somebody like, you know, most small third uh, private label sellers who are actually feeding their kids off their Amazon listings. Those people that are feeding their kids off their Amazon listings can eat them alive, right? Um, so we, we have a tool there. You push the button, boom. It, it actually ranks and, and shows you the opportunity based on the current competition that's currently there. There's a whole bunch of factors. But I look for things like lazy sellers, right? That's really appealing to me. Really non-sexy uh, niches like I would never go into supplements for example unless they were like really fringe supplements like I don't know dogs with anxiety tablets you know that that might be something I'd be looking at or um, you know uh, cats that have a hair loss problem you know they're still big markets <laughs> self-conscious cats with a hair loss problem <laughs> yeah That's you know great. it could be 500,000 cats in America that fit that category, but you can bet your bottom dollar that the owners are nuts, right? Because they're crazy cat people that love that cat. So rather than going for like, um, you know, weight loss cream or, you know, Garcinia Gambosia tablets for, at one point was like everybody was, you know, but people go, oh, look at the money in, in you know, like cellulite cream. And you're like, yeah, and look at how many people are selling it. Um, it's just, it, you know, I look for the, the less obvious. I would, I, I would recommend to people spend three months looking for that one opportunity where you go, wow, that's, that's really good. And I've seen them and they're always 
boring, non, you know, like yeah, I saw one the other day, which is, you know, it's my own idea. So I looked it up was, you know, I pulled into our car park here. We've got a big office here you just saw. And, you know, where the car's pulling at the car park, there's that sort of rubber stopper, like a curb that's on the concrete. They do like 10 or 15 grand a month and there's like no innovation. It's just like these old school industrial companies selling rubber strips. And, you know, that to me is really interesting because Daryl in Ecom has taken a shitty photo and uploaded their whole catalog and nobody cares, but people need those things. Property developers all over America who are building on uh, building sites now, they're just ordering off Amazon and having it shipped direct to the, the work site instead of going to Home Depot. So, you know, how much is there in plastic buckets? How much is there in, you know, just just boring stuff that people need? Rivets, braces um, for builders, you know, the, the, all these kinds of things are what's interesting for me and not what, you know, the inexperienced mum and dad Amazon seller wants to sell what looks pretty. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, like the example you gave earlier of the young marketing hacker guys, like, None of those guys want to go if they're out meeting girls at the bar. They don't want to tell them that they sell incontinence bladders for old men. You know what I mean? Like they, they want to be exactly. selling supplements. They want to be selling something sexy. Um, so maybe can you take us through an example of how would you go about developing a unique product to serve this kind of market? Well, it depends, right? It, it, it depends on uh, in some cases. We have a student who just found a market, Just it was the photography, that the, the people in that whole category just sucked at photography. Nobody did a good job. So sometimes the innovation could be as simple as hiring a great photographer, but at the product level, if you're gonna create something cool, like I just launched a, a patented product in one of my brands, I actually hired a uh, three designers on Upwork and I, I gave them 500 bucks each and said, just draw me some sketches. This is the product that I, that I want designed. It's a mold product, it'll require a mold. And the mold is about 10 grand. So I, I said, before we go too far, just, just give me some ideas. Here's the space. Here's all the top selling products on Amazon in that category. I want something that appeals to, a, it was a product for men, very masculine product. It's a physical product. And um, gave them a really detailed brief. And then very quickly, one of the three had a real demonstrated competency for that type of product. I ended up paying, I think, two grand in design fees. It got a beautiful design, which we then... Um, uh, they turned into CAD drawings. We did a 3D print of the product and that product was then um, uh, turned into a mold and it's gone in and I own the patent on that product. So it cost me about $2,000 for the design and $10,000 for the product. But I already sell about eight products in that category. But the problem is they still do good. You know, they still make me great money. But eight years ago, I was the only guy and all the other guys have since copied that product and sourced it from the same suppliers. So now I've still got... I'm probably one of the biggest sellers in one product. I am the biggest seller. It still probably does 30 grand a month for me, but it used to do a hundred, right? Um, so, and because the, 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 the gross sales pool now is divided across 30 people with exactly the same product. And I still do make a living off it because I have more reviews and, and, and you know, I did better photography even now. But so it cost me 12 grand in, in that upfront work, but I will be the only seller of it for life because it cost me uh, about 1500 bucks for the, for the design patent. So all up, um, it cost me thirteen and a half thousand dollars to protect that marketplace of that product. Cause each product, if it's unique, it's its own marketplace if it takes off and goes well. So that's how I would go about it. Um, but to start with, it's, it's kind of an ascension, right? So to start with, you know, it could be just um, photography, packaging and brand, depending on the category that you're in, innovate, get your wheels going, get some cash flow coming in. I'm able to throw 14 grand at something, you know, now because I have tons of cash flow and inventory. Um, but it, it, it takes a minute to get there. But just always think about innovation. And then the next stage is protectable innovation. And once you get there, then you've got a business super valuable because nobody can sell that exact product, um, which, is, which is awesome. This podcast is brought to you by Kenji ROI, a complete done-for-you service for your Amazon listing creation and optimization. Everything from product photography, including lifestyle images with a real model, graphic design images and studio images, 
to the copywriting and keyword optimization, to videos, and enhanced brand content if you're lucky enough to have brand registry. We also manage marketing when it comes to Amazon ads, and also for some bigger sellers out there who might be interested in building a messenger list, we offer services creating the many chat funnels to follow up with customers for more reviews, to help build your own audience so you can launch new products to help rank for new keywords. Um, and there is Facebook ad management built into that as well for the right sellers. So if you want to learn more about Kenji ROI, head to K-E-N-J-I-R-O-I.com. That is actually my middle name, Kenji, with the R-O-I added onto the end. And so where do you find the balance between, I mean, you say that, you know, get that first dollar made on Amazon, just get that product up there and get it sold. Uh, where do you find the balance between that and I'm going to drop 13 grand on protecting this product and, you know, probably another 13 on inventory, um, you know, where, where is the in between there? Or do you recommend that people just really have to have to go for it? They have to have that capital to start or what is your opinion on that? No, you know, Ascension is definitely the best way to go. So start off with just trying to make $1. So we run a program here in at reliable education and, um, it's called the Project 100. So our students get together, they each put a hundred bucks in the pool. So we take a whole intake of them. Everybody put, pays a hundred dollars to enter. And that hundred dollar pool on the last one was $15,000 became the prize money. And so then we take them through a, a 12 week coaching program and put them into a private, um, uh, Vo we use Voxer, which is like a walkie talkie. And, and we basically say, right, the deadline for opening your seller account is this day. The deadline for ordering your products is this day. The de and they can't spend more than a hundred bucks. So it's called Project 100 because you can only spend 100 bucks and the winner who makes the most sales of the product gets all 15 grand. And so it's a really great way to, and, and what happens is if people just make one sale, the lights come on in their brain. They're like, oh man, this actually works. This Amazon thing's real. Like our students have done half a billion dollars in sales in three and a half years. That's actually tracked through our software. There's the students are using our software linked to their Amazon accounts, $500 million. Across our community of 8,000 students, that's a $62,000 per head. And when you consider half of them haven't gone live probably, it's like 100 grand per head on average. It's an amazing success rate. That's why we've grown so much and have, have such a big business today. Um, but uh, the, the whole point of that Project 100 is to get them live. And even though they see that 500 million in sales, until they make $1 themselves, it's not real for them. So once they've made that $1, you see them go, oh my God, I have an Amazon account. I know how to create a listing and I know that they pay me. All I've got to now do is get my first product. So start off with a product that just, you can go into the market, you can differentiate through photography and branding and, um, and then take a piece of that market, right? Get you, yourself up to five, ten thousand $10,000 a month in sales, get a second product, get up to $20,000 in sales. And then when you start getting up to that, 40, 50 grand a month mark, then start thinking about, all right, I've, I've now got some cash coming in. I'm probably making 15 grand a month profit. Um, you're going to, you know, most of that's just going to be chewed straight back into growth if you've got good, you know, good situations. So you might need to be even beyond that before you go into those patentable products, but that's where you want to be skating towards, right? So go into a market where there's boring, differentiate, take as much of the market as you can, get as many reviews as you can, expect it to teeter off a bit as the competition comes. And then maybe in your second year or third year, start to look into, um, you know, some stuff you can protect. That's sort of the ascension model that I would teach. And so those products that are in the in-between stage, are they completely undifferentiated white label products or are there certain ways um, this, this kind of segues into um, just kind of a two-part question. Are there certain ways that you can differentiate the product that are not as expensive that don't need like a $10,000 mold, for example, like maybe you can get it done in a different shape or, or different, uh, different options mm. for making it unique without spending, you know, five figures on just that investment? Yeah, yeah, look, there are, you know, like, for example, in that shower chair space. Somebody um, has just launched one recently, like they're all like, you know what a shower chair is, right? Plastic bench and four legs that are silver with little holes in them. So you can adjust the height. It's for old people, and, you know, right? Old people, shower chairs. People. Yeah. 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 They, they, they usually got gray legs and a white plastic um, top with holes in it. So the water runs through and you look at them and you feel like you're dying. Like you feel like you're in a hospital at your own home. <laughs> so it's, they're terrible, right? Um, I don't know what it is with medical products. They're always pale blue or pale yellow or pale pink or white, <laughs> you know, and gray. There's nothing, you know. So it could be in that somebody just launched a shower chair where they've just put like a 
like a padded, it's like a silicon um, blue rubber inlay. Uh, rather than just being solid hard, they've just recessed this silicon inlay that's bright blue. And so you look on page one, and it's just white, 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 white with this blue um, silicon inlay there. And it immediately catches your attention. It immediately looks slightly better quality because it's got the logo debossed into it, you know. Um, and it draws your attention. And, and I'm sure they're doing great as a result of it. So sometimes that can be just a very, very lit, simple differentiation. Getting a product designer involved sometimes can just be such a powerful thing to do. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's always about just looking for that little thing, but just being open and get somebody with, remember, Amazon is a visual platform. Um, it's like Tinder. It is the Tinder of products. So it's what can you do visually to get the attention in a positive way. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's quite simple. You know, just it, 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 it doesn't require a lot. And just so people have some insight into, you know, that, like the different ways that they could differentiate and stuff like that. Um, I'm sure someone wouldn't want to go on Fiverr and, you know, hire three people for $500 each to create a bunch of different designs only to go to their manufacturer and realize, oh, hey, this is going to cost like a, a big, bigger chunk of money than they're willing to spend. So like, what is the process for this? Are you literally just asking manufacturers, hey, you know, I would like to create a design like this with a custom inlay, like, you know, would you be able to do that? Or what kind of costs are associated? Or, or like, maybe you can walk us through um, the kind of levels of, of like the $10,000 mold and like this specific yeah. design. First of all, I think we need to set a baseline, right? So we, we get a lot of inquiries from people saying, uh, you know, dude, I, I want to get started on Amazon. I've been told I can start with a thousand bucks. And I'm like, dude, no, you can't, right? This, this idea that you can start a real business for one or $2,000, no. You're better off going and driving Uber for six months and save up till you got $15,000 because by the time you buy inventory, by the time you pay for photography, by the time you get samples, I'll give you one tip on samples that for your listeners, go to Upwork, get somebody who speaks perfect English and perfect Chinese, usually going to be a student, and get them to be your China side employee, right? Employee. And have your samples sent to them and do what we're doing right now on a Zoom call when the samples arrive. Because in China, for like less than five bucks, they can ship almost every, anything overnight to anywhere in China, as opposed to paying DHL 150 bucks to get a ship from China to Australia. And I'm sure it's probably the same in America. Um, get a China side sourcing assistant whose sole job is to receive samples and show them to you. But by the time you pay for samples, by the time you pay for photos, by the time you get decent inventory, some packaging, some graphic design and all that stuff, you know, you're going to need at least at least six or seven, but preferably 10 to 15. It's a real business. And I think so many people go wrong because they go into Amazon with two grand in their pocket and they're, they're not even in the game. They're not even close to being in the game. And the reason we've got so many students is we said this from day one. We told people it's risky, it's hard, it's really competitive, and you've got to be exceptional to succeed. And you'll need probably five, 10 grand on top of the course price to do it. In fact, we refund people if they don't. Um, because we believe that strongly in it, even if they bought the course. Because otherwise, it, it, those days are gone of just going in there and you've got to be prepared to spend some money. And if you don't have the money and you live in the West, go drive an Uber, go take a second job, go do what you need to do. You know, I, I don't know what to tell you. So the idea that you're going to avoid all risk and not spend any money is just a fantasy that hackers need to get over. You need to actually realize this is a business and you need to spend some money. Absolutely. I just want to echo what Adam said. Um, we do have a number of people that, you know, a number of people each week that reach out to our agency, Kenji ROI, that they just obviously are not in a place uh, where they can really afford to make it work, right? Just like Adam said, they have, they've been told, unfortunately, by a lot of the Amazon gurus out there that you can actually start an entire business with $2,000 or something like that. Um, and that's just not true. So guys, honestly, listen to guys like Adam. Um, he's telling the straight talk like 15 grand is like is great. Um, I know a lot of people out there that have started with a much larger chunk of money, like whatever they have investors or they, they have a chunk of money from something else. The more the better, to be honest. Um, and I love what Adam's saying there because it's it's the honest truth. Don't listen to the gurus out there. Um, but uh, just back to that that point about the differentiation, is it is it really um, it, like what would you what would you say like is another method like 
you have the the product mold is there any other kind of frameworks of differentiation that you would come to a um, a manufacturer and say hey can you make this with a product mold or hey can you um 3d print this uh specific type of product yep yeah sometimes like with the cake the cake molds right mm -hmm. so the the molds for those are cheap because they're silicon molds so they're far less expensive than for example a glass mold right where you've got to have they're made in cast iron right so they're different types of molds and this is what you learn by looking at different categories um so you know um so in a cake mold, you just need like if you went to, um, uh, you know, a, a cartoonist right on Upwork and said, I need some really cool um, cake molds for these markets. And you think about America as a marketplace and who's getting married there. You know, like we sort of half jokingly said Donald Trump uh, is funny, but there's millions of people that love Donald Trump in America. Right. That's it's actually not altogether an awful idea. Um and a cake, a cake topper has gas factor. People do care about it because it says something about them. But, you know, for to take it to another level, like a bedpan that you, that you uh, people have to wee into when they're in hospital, right? There, there's no innovation in the bedpan space, not surprisingly. So what if you just put a target or you put a politician's face on there? Or, you, you know what I mean? Or, you, you know, smile, you're not dead yet. Um, so, something like that. We're still human beings at the end of the day that are using this stuff, right? There's a lot of, you know, um, there's, there is a market out there. If you're in these huge categories, you know, rather than trying to compete with the plain white bedpan that's probably doing $20,000 a month, try to differentiate in a way and appeal to a market that might only be five or $6,000 a month, which honestly is going to be much more suited to the smaller Amazon investor anyway, because you're not going to be able to keep up with a 20 grand a month in sales from the get go if you're struggling to get 15 grand together, right? So. You, you, you need to be thinking, I don't necessarily be, need to be number one, but I need to be a differentiated product that is going to consistently tick over. And the great thing about being number two is that it's stable. Right? <laughs> number one, everybody wants your head. Heavy is the head, right? That, that wears the crown. So there's nothing wrong with being a consistent number two with a freaky little product that just the freaks like. Um, so I, I'm really interested in that. And I've seen students come in and they go into a huge category, right? For example, weighted blankets. And they go, oh man, the weighted blankets are doing $200,000 a month. And all the big guys with unlimited money are gonna go in there and they're, they're, they're happy to trade on six, eight, ten percent margin. I mean, do you wanna start an Amazon business on less than 10% margin? Forget it. That doesn't warrant the risk. Their game is we have a shit ton of capital we can either put it in the bank and get a term deposit for 3% or we can put it into Amazon and make 10. We're making 300% more than we can anywhere else. You don't want to compete with Amazon basics, right? So you've got to realize the game that you're playing. And, and if you wade into weighted blankets, what happened there? They were 150 bucks. Now they're 50 because the Chinese manufacturers have gone in and said, we're happy to take 10% because we have so much money that we earned off of you guys that we're going to just go direct now and make 10% and we're gonna own the market and we're gonna turn our money over every 60 days. So we're gonna compound our cash at 10% every 60 days, insane. So that's why if you look at those big markets now, the world is waking up to the fact that Amazon is a compound interest machine without an equal. We as little um, nuggety um, resourceful entrepreneurs need to carve out, know who we are in the jungle and carve out a little space for ourselves knowing that there are some lions getting around in that joint. That certainly, certainly is great advice. And that segues perfectly into the next thing I want to talk about, which is you are someone with 20 plus years of entrepreneurial experience. Um, you know, you're doing multiple eight figures in sales. You have 8,000 students. I'm sure you see a lot of patterns when it comes to things that entrepreneurs need to develop in themselves, like personal development things. They have to get over mental blocks or um, things that they, they have to grow into as an entrepreneur, right? So I'm wondering, like, what do you see are are the biggest ways that entrepreneurs have to grow themselves to then grow their businesses? Yeah. So I think, you know, a, a lot of the times, um, you uh, people aspiring to be entrepreneurs and I don't, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to segue out of a job and they're trying to become full-time self-employed people. And here's some patterns that I see with people going through that transition or they're in the entrepreneur life, but they're not really reaping the benefits yet. I don't have enough cash 
coming in that they, they don't have to work anymore. They're still hustling their backsides off. All their money's being poured in. So here's some advice for anyone in that category. Here's the first book I'd recommend, The One Thing. This book here is an absolute cracker. And um, it's written by Gary Keller, who's the you know, co-founder of Keller Williams, one of the huge real estate agency uh, realtors in the US. It's not about realty. It's around knowing what the one thing is that you are focusing on right now in your in your life. Because most people just struggle with t carving out focused time to do the work necessary to get the goal they want. They, they write down and dream what they want, but the actual work is another thing. To sit down at the end of a long day and do proper product research with real disciplined approach to it is tough. So this book here is great. One of our students, not a student actually, one of the guys who spoke for us, his name is Raj, um, recommended this book to me. He was working full-time job, um, had one hour a day to do Amazon. He grew it to 250,000 US a month before he quit his job. He quit his job and now he's doing 4 million a year on Amazon. And that is the book that changed his life. The next one is this one, The Dip. And this is Knowing When to Quit. This is by Seth Godin. So Seth Godin wrote Purple Cow, which is another phenomenal book. But the dip talks about, as you can see that little icon there, the, the question mark upside down with the dip on its side, like a question mark for now, it was very clever. Um, it talks about knowing when to push and knowing when to quit. And there are some people that get this half truth in their head, never, 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 never quit. There are some businesses that are dogs and you should get off them as fast as possible and get on a racehorse, right? Because the success is a horse race, not a dog race. So I don't care how good a jockey you are. I don't care how good the dog is. You're going to lose. And we take it so personal sometimes. Like we go, you know, to a Tony Robbins seminar. And I love Tony. As I said, I spoke with Tony just last weekend. And people are jumping up and down, do their incantations. They set their goals. They think positively. And then they fail. And they go, I'm doing it. It must be all about me. I'm doing something wrong. No, sometimes you're just selling the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong structure. You've just got to keep going. You've just got to not quit until you find the right thing at the right time in the right structure because there's a lot of dumb people out there making a lot of money because they're doing the right thing at the right time and you're a smart person doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. So, you know, when I was younger, I took it all so personally and now I'm just ruthless on who's going to buy this, how do I know they're going to buy this until it's market tested. You know, you've got to be just ruthless and try to keep your, your emotions in check and look at a marketplace objectively and say, am I really solving a problem? If I printed off the, the top 10 products on Amazon, the photo, just the photo alone, and put them on a wall in a lineup, and then I put my hero shot for my product, which I got done by a 3D renderer for 100 bucks, I throw that on the wall amongst them, and I get 10 strangers that come in that roughly fit the avatar of the customer I want to buy it. Which one of those photos do you like best if you're buying one of those? If I don't get picked four out of the 10 times, I'm out of there. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, I need to know it has to be that obvious. And people just don't have those disciplines. They fall in love with their own story and, and, and then they're screwed. Yeah, absolutely. Super, super important advice. Um, and if you had to choose one more resource to give to the Actualized Freedom audience, whether it's a book or, um, or anything, what would you choose? Oh, wow. Uh, the resource probably isn't one you can get off the shelf, but it's to get yourself in a mastermind and um, get around three to four other people that, that want to actualize freedom as well, that legitimately want agency over their life and are prepared to do the work. So look for three people that you like, trust and respect. And those are the, my three rules for doing business with anyone. Do I like this person? Do I trust this person? Do I respect them? And if it's no to any of them, I'm out. But if I like trust and respect them and we're both going for a similar goal, it might not be the same goal, but we're both moving towards it. Having a meeting once a month, and this is in Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. They did this way back when. Having a meeting once a month where you get together and you say, all right, this is what I'm shooting for. So last month, Danny, you said that you were going to do this in your business. You obviously have goals and things you're shooting for. And I go, Danny, how did you go last month with that? And all of us are going to ask you. Now, because you know that's coming, we're all going to ask you, you're going to do those things because you know, if you don't, we're going to give you shit, right? And so you do those things. And if you don't, we give you shit. And then we say, Danny, what are you going to do next month? You go, all right, I'm going to do this, this, and this. All right, cool. We're going to commit to it. Bang. And then it's time to change to the next person by holding each other accountable to the actions that are required to, to get the things that we want. That's how those actions get done. 
So a mastermind's really important. And I've been in masterminds. I've paid to be in masterminds. I've been in ones that I've formed for over a decade now. And, um, and I've seen my friends, you know, who, who were in those masterminds. One of them just sold his company last year for 130 million in cash. Uh, another one sold in the private trade sale for 40 million. And when we started 10 years ago together as mates, you know, we were, these were pipe dreams, right? But we just set, you know, monthly accountable uh, actions, held each other accountable, and it cost us nothing more than a bottle of uh, red wine once a month to, to share down. And, and we also developed great friendships. Like next weekend, I'm going away with three of my mastermind friends on a, on a, a, a yacht up in the Whit Sundays. We're just going to go sailing for a week as mates just shoot the shit. We're all successful. We've all made millions and, and it's because we supported each other on the way. Love that. I love that. That's a great note to end on. Um, and mastermind groups for myself personally have been incredibly, incredibly valuable as well. And I can certainly say that I would not have built what I have today if it was not for the support of the various people um, and the real strong relationships that have built with those people over the years in the mastermind groups. Uh, so Adam, man, this has been incredible. Um, went over a lot of really valuable stuff here. And if people want to find out more about what you do online or reach out to you, where can they do so? The best is just Reliable Education is our company name. So it's www.reliable.education. There's no .com. .education, come and check us out. And um, if we can help you in any way, please feel free. Just know like you, they'll get it straight. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. And guys, if you want the show notes or any of the resources mentioned in this episode, we'll have that over at actualizedfreedom.com. And if you haven't already, please go leave us a review on iTunes or any kind of whatever podcast app you listen to us on. Leave us a review. Really like to hear your feedback. And until next time, guys, take care. This podcast is sponsored by the Helium 10 suite of tools. And we at Kenji ROI have been using Helium 10 for more than three years now. They have so many tools packed into one, I don't think that there's a better value. Um, and we use it all the time for ourselves and our clients. So we can actually recommend it from real experience. We use their keyword tracker to see how our product launches are doing. The keyword indexing tool to ensure that you're actually showing up for your main keywords. Super, super important step right there. And also Magnet and Cerebro, a really powerful combination for finding keywords your competitors are using or just finding new keywords to put into your listing in general. You should be using this on you know, at least a monthly basis to see if any new keywords are coming up um, because new searches are coming up all the time, guys. Like people are searching on Google. Um, I forget the number, but a huge percentage of those searches are brand new, never been done searches. So if you guys want a discount code, you can use 50 Kenji ROI for 50% off your first month of Helium 10 or 10 Kenji ROI for 10% off for life. So that's a pretty good discount. You might as well. Um, we use them and recommend them for years. So if you guys need that, you guys will definitely get good value out of Helium 10. For show notes and resources mentioned in this episode, visit KenjiROI.com.